The thing is, the Marines were tasked to come to be trained. They had no idea what the program was or what they were going to be doing. And so they would be sitting there and out would walk Mary and Carrie and the aquatic specialist for the Marine Corps who was named Carrie. So we had the <laughs> Carrie, and Carrie show. The thing is, Terry and I are both about five feet tall. Hi everyone. My name is Dr. Rita Roy, CEO at the National Spine Health Foundation, and I'm your host for the Get Back To It podcast, where we tell real stories of healing and recovery. What does it mean to get back to it? It means overcoming injury through treatments that work in order to return to the people and activities you love, whatever that looks like for you. It means getting back to your life. We're here to share the success stories of those who did just that, and some of these stories you are not going to believe. At the Get Back To It podcast, our goal is to tell stories of spinal champions who have been able to achieve a better quality of life through spinal health care. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Mary Weichel. Dr. Mary Weichel, PhD, is president and consultant and primary trainer for MW Associates. She has been an adjunct professor for Northern Virginia Community College for many years and a presenter for the International Aquatic Fitness Conference. Dr. Weichel led the performance improvement study and development of two aquatic programs for wounded warriors for the Army. Most recently, she developed the Aquatic Physical Training Program, Aquatics Maximum Power Intense Training for the U.S. Marine Corps. Mary's continued work with the military included an approved study for the Intrepid Spirit Center that concentrates on incorporating aquatic programming for patients with chronic pain, traumatic brain injury, dementia, and addiction. Outside of her very impressive background, Dr. Weichel is a spinal champion who continued to prioritize physical activity while seeking treatments over the course of many years. Now that you know what to expect, let's get back to it and dive right into Dr. Weichel's story. Dr. Weichel's saga began on Christmas Eve, 1982, on the top of the Zugspit, which is the highest mountain in Germany. Her husband and two oldest sons were busy exploring all of the runs, and she was with her three-year-old on the easy slope. Having just spent the winter as a ski instructor, she was entertaining herself by doing 360-degree turns and skiing the slope backwards. As luck would have it, uh, I did catch a ski tip and went down, suffering a complete spiral fracture of the tibia uh, right above the ankle, but it did not break the fibula. I was taken off the mountain and down the mountain in a cable car, from there to an ambulance to an American clinic, the big American hospital in Germany, which I opted for. And the orthopedist there said, uh, let's let it sit for a month and then do surgery to straighten it. And so when he did that, he took a piece of the fibula out. But he was a very young orthopedic doctor and he took too big of a piece out and the fibula never grew back together again. So for many years, we never knew that he had not been able to straighten the tibia and the fibula had never grown back together. Well, living in Germany, I loved my schnitzels and my hummerfritz. And so I <laughs> also took up running in addition to swimming and never realized the damage I was doing to the rest of my body as I ran. And as we go on and talk, we'll talk about how our entire body is connected and it starts from the base of support and goes all the way up through the top of the head. Dr. Weichel continued to run, swim, and ski. Physical activity and fitness were driving her to push herself more than ever before. All was going very smoothly until the mid-1990s when severe ankle pain led to the discovery that she had lost the cartilage in her right ankle because her right lower leg had never set straight. The solution was arthroscopic surgery followed by a simple fusion, but that fusion failed within the year. After I had the simple fusion, the doctor retired from the army and I was turned over to a resident who said, you must walk on it for it to heal. The ankle specialist had said, no weight bearing. And so it failed and I ended up having the second fusion a year later. 
And a year after that, I developed a fracture in my lower leg at the point of the original fracture. And so you could say I spent three summers in a cast, but I continued teaching anyway. When I got off the table after they took the cast off, I, when I stepped down, my first thought was, my foot didn't touch the ground where it was supposed to. And so I gave no thought to it then. And I said nothing because I wanted to move on. But I did become cognizant of the fact that after two simple fusions, that means they continue to take bone off. I had lost some leg length. Dr. Weichel went on to find an aquatic therapy and rehabilitation practice where she could seek treatment, but quickly began teaching for them. She got certified in aquatic exercise and ran that program at a pool she had frequented over the years. She was able to look at her mother and sister and see a definite genetic and environmental link in the progression of her symptoms. My mother had severe osteoporosis. I watched it progress as she aged. My sister is also older than I am. She has more of a kyphotic posture now than she did before. With that, I was having a lot of pain, complaining about the severe back pain that I was having. And my GYN doctor said that, you know, you need to have fine or your orthopedist look at your back again. The thing I did not realize was that he had been watching my neck, that he had not been watching what was happening with my back. back. And in less than a year, I had gone from maybe a 14 degree curvature in my back to over 40 degrees. And so he did, I believe, a six or eight level fusion surgery. That was shocking. It was done to correct uh, the advancement of the scoliosis. After I had that first, it was a nine level fusion. Uh, within about a month to six weeks, uh, I was again teaching. I taught uh, yoga, Pilates, ballroom dance, you name it. I taught anything they wanted because I loved what I did. And so he was as shocked as I was. I put my trust in him and that's when I had the surgery. It was, it was shocking, but I was willing to do anything to get out of pain. I was living on painkillers and uh, I would time them so that I could teach before it would wear off again. <laughs> and then I, I could take another one. That's incredible. Such uh, resiliency in mustering through that pain so that you could do the activities that you want to do. I, I think it is just amazing that the, the doctors were looking at one aspect of your spine, maybe focusing on your neck, but not looking at the full picture um, of your back. And not until you know a gynecologist said, oh, you're having extreme lower back pain, uh, maybe we should take a look at your full spine. Um, that's when that picture was discovered. I was sort of fused at the angle that I was at rather than being straight. Probably because I was so active. You know, I understand how the, the discs above and below have to take on a lot more of your activity and bending. And that fusion failed. I went back and the original doctor had retired by that time and I had another new one. He said the, the fusion has failed and I need to fuse you to T3. I was on my way to a luncheon when I got the news and I said, okay. And I really thought nothing of it because um, I still had pretty good range of motion and that's because of um, the yoga, the Pilates, I was a dancer, I did gymnastics. Dr. Weichel's back fusion did not stop her from staying active. The years following her spinal fusion, however, were when she encountered an array of spine-related troubles. She sought expert spine care from a physician after experiencing pain, which she thought was her sciatica, and her physician discovered a broken screw. After a few more challenges, the broken hardware was removed and Dr. Weichel was able to continue her life with no pain medication. Since then, the discs above degenerated and uh, it was noticed uh, on an x-ray 
that um, there was a gray area at the top of T3 and upon a, a CT scan and an MRI that T2 had slipped into spondylolisthesis and was pressing against the spinal cord because I was having, I uh, feeling a lot of weakness in my legs. Um, I gave in, uh, I put it off for a month and um, I am now fused through T1 to the sacrum. You can guess that the same pattern remained true. Dr. Weichel got back to the activities she loved as she always had on her amazing journey. I am still a challenge in progress. What is the bottom line? Most likely it goes back to the broken leg not healing correctly, leading to uneven leg length and ultimately leading to my spinal issues. If the skeletal system is weakened or misaligned, another has to take on its work. The song about each bone being connected to the next one is true. Dr. Weichel, your story is so unique in many ways um, and, and unique due to the fact that you're a patient, but also you have an array of professional expertise. Can you share with us what specifically about your knowledge and professional background encouraged you to keep moving after so many setbacks? And, and what wisdom would you share with our audience in, in that area? I think the main wisdom I would share is that you have to have a positive outlook. Uh, you, you can't say, you can't have pity on yourself. And I've seen too many people just go from maybe being active to inactive. But uh, you, you continue doing and uh, you find a way to do what you want to do. And uh, I'm always happy to mentor people. I'm happy to take part and share in any way I can. Finding of the Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute uh, really helped me have a more expert knowledge about uh, how the water is a therapeutic environment for anyone who has any type of back issues. That's fantastic advice. And I love that you're willing to mentor anybody um, who would come to you with, um, with challenges. Um, you, you seem to have such a strong grasp of the paths that, that have led to your various physical challenges. It was sort of like a domino effect in your body. Can you share with, with our listeners how, how it felt to continue to discover new setbacks and, and how your attitude changed or didn't change over time. You talk about having a positive outlook and maintaining a positive outlook. How can you help people to find that within themselves? What, what advice do you have? Yeah, I do not think of them as setbacks. I think of them as challenges. Uh, I always thought about how to continue what I was doing and what I enjoy the most. I understood the muscular and neuromuscular systems the, and the importance of core stabilization, balance, and uh, PNF, your uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation uh, movements, which are all um, on a diagonal because we never reach straight forward. And our movements for activities of daily living. Uh, my training in uh, Yengar yoga and Pilates had provided correct uh, movement to continue a normal life. I also was a swimmer. I'm still a swimmer. Uh, currently, I'm not competing because uh, I'm very competitive and I like to be number one. But I still continue to swim every day. And I understand the principles and the properties of water and how they provide a way to continue working on the alignment, the flexibility and strength needed to transfer any injuries that we've had back onto land. We heal much faster when we're in the water. One thing that strikes me about uh, talking with you today is that you, you, know, you, you look at your challenges, your setbacks as um, really just, just uh, really that, just a challenge, just another another way of testing yourself to see 
you know, how you can overcome that. And um, much, much like a trained athlete would look at various physical challenges and say, I'm up for that. And I think your approach to your physical challenges really comes from that innate athlete inside of you. I think the other thing that I'm hearing today is that your professional expertise, your knowledge, um, knowledge of the musculoskeletal system, the neuromuscular um, system, enabled you to realize that the way to overcome these challenges is through movement and proper movement. One of the things that the Spine Health Foundation that we are so focused on doing is educating people about prevention and about treatment options and about healthy living. I think a lot of people just don't know what to do to get better and people give up. They lose hope and they often are focused on what they used to be able to do. And we work so hard here to help people change their mindset that it's not what, what you used to be able to do, but it's what can you do now? And what are you going to do about it? And, and I love hearing from you that, you know, it's, it's a little bit a matter of educating yourself and having the right mindset. And we are very dedicated here at the National Spine Health Foundation to giving people the education they need in order to help themselves improve. And we are here to give hope, to tell people that you can get better, you can get back to your life. And your story is so compelling because of the numerous challenges that you've been through and you just kept moving and you just kept getting back to your life. Let's do this. Let's get past it and let's get back to life. And that's just so encouraging. And that is just so inspiring to so many people. I, I so appreciate you sharing that story with us today. I'd like to talk a little bit about the unusual year that 2020 has been for so many people with this being a year that we faced a global pandemic. And we're recording this conversation here in the summer of 2020. And, you know, it, it's been a year where we have tried really hard to get messages out about staying moving. So when you are living at home, working at home, learning at home, staying at home, it's important to move. You know, in the summertime, aquatic therapy is so enjoyable. People are in swimming pools or going to beaches um, and really enjoying the outdoors and, and being in water. I know that, you know, beaches closed, pools closed this year, and yet when there have been small openings for people to be able to experience uh, being in the water, that has been such a relief for a lot of people. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of aquatic therapy to healing and recovery? And, and if people only have a limited amount of time, what would you give them as the top things they should be thinking about in terms of getting into the water? First of all, let me just go back to a little bit about the coronavirus and uh, the obstacles is presented because pools were closed for quite a while. And I know some pools are open now. I'm lucky that the pool we belong to is open. Uh, you can reserve a lane for 45 minutes and they are offering aquatic exercise classes. I do preach to many of those that participate because so many of them complain about back pain. I say, take the bounce out. Uh, we don't want you bouncing off the bottom of the pool. But, um, I have a really good friend in Austin who's a physical therapist, and she and I were tasked with uh, writing the position paper uh, for how to open a physical and aquatic therapy pool. And so uh, we did follow the CDC guidelines and the model aquatic health code. With that, know that it's hard to understand why pools are so closed. Uh, yes, they should be limited. No, you should not have access to locker rooms. You come ready for the pool and you leave and you go home and you shower again. But you cannot catch COVID-19 in the swimming pool. The chemistry in the water dilates it to the point that it's not transferable. So it's really the safest place for us to be. I'm really, uh, really like to get that point across. And I feel so bad for so many because I do a lot of work with drown proofing and drowning and areas like this. What we should be having our patients look at is, well, if you've had a fusion, a spinal fusion, 
know that you're probably going to be out of the pool for three months anyway. Uh, that's the basic guideline. We can't get past that. We've got to see some healing taking place before we can put you back in. We look at level of the fusion and we put you in the pool. That area either has to be immersed under the surface of the water or you have to be in shallow water uh, above the side of the fusion because of the difference between the air and the water pressure. And so we don't want those two competing with each other because we know the density of the water is 13 times greater than um, the air. And if we have you really moving, it can go up to 300 times. And so we can't have that pressure against that new fusion area. But we work a lot with uh, developing adequate core strength. Um, one of the programs I did develop was Aqua Piochi, which is Aqua for Pilates, Yoga, and I Chi. I Chi is a program that's very similar to Tai Chi, but done in the water and is extremely calming. It's just what we've used with the TBI and the PTSD patients a lot. But we have to look at this because we have to really consider what is the effect of the viscosity, velocity, and resistance of the water and the type of movement that we're going to have our patients do. And so each patient needs a specific program. The one thing we have to remember is that we can help you heal fast in the water but we've got to transition you back to land because you live on land. With that, we work on core strength. As a matter of fact, this past weekend, uh, one of the classes I taught was a functional core stabilization for balancing gait. After that, then we have to work on developing your muscular strength because we're looking at the local stabilizing muscles versus the global muscles. And the stabilizing muscles really do protect that lumbar spine and help slow down erosion or wearing away of the discs between those lumbar spine. And so uh, we work on that and we begin to get you moving. We work with some agility. And until you can show that you have core strength, we cannot take you to deep water because when you get into deep water, you lose all proprioception. And so you don't know where your body is, so you have to be able to have an idea of how to have that core strength to maintain the proper alignment. So we do that. Teaching with the Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute, we teach all over the world. I know people in almost every country, and we're like one big family, and we communicate often. Uh, this year we have had to take our courses to Zoom, uh, which has been a tremendous challenge. The lecture parts are easy, but unless you have your own personal pool, we have to find a pool that we can go to and videotape. So we do that. And um, in training, let me go back to muscular strength because I'm very, I have a very athlete mind here. Um, we use resistive or drag equipment. I do not like the foam dumbbells. That is because they only provide an eccentric contraction. There are no concentric uh, uh, contractions because of buoyancy. The equipment I use is uh, basically uh, hard plastic that give you the same strengthening that you would get as if you went to the weight room on land. And, and that's important because we have to have that muscular balance between the opposite muscles in the body. Everything that we teach has to be research-based. We mainly train physical therapists, occupational therapists. I can't emphasize the importance of PTs and OTs working together for somebody who's had a spinal fusion. And then we have our recreational, our massage therapists, and we also have personal trainers because our goal is once we get through the limited sessions, we have them in aquatic therapy or rehab, then we need to move them to somebody else who is educated on how to continue what they have been doing before we turn them loose 
and let them do whatever they want to do. I will also add that what we are trying to do is not only improve their activities of daily living, but their quality of life. And that's, that's the bottom line. And there is no such thing as an aquatic therapist. Physical therapist trained in aquatic therapy or uh, you are an aquatic specialist. And so uh, it's very important to look at the training that the person uh, providing aquatic rehabilitation has had. And uh, I will put a plug in for Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute that we do offer certification. And so that the ones that are certified are mainly have a therapy background. And this also includes kinesiotherapists because that's who the BA systems use. This is fascinating information. I'm curious, are, are any of your programs available to the public? Yes. I'm in the process of putting more programs online. Right now, I either sell through my website or the Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute and also the Aquatic Exercise Association has dedicated online education because it is important that anyone who is certified in either area must maintain CEUs to maintain uh, accreditation. Yes, you can go on and for ATRI, it's www.atri.org. And for the Aquatic Exercise Association, it's www.aea. W-A-V-E, wait, dot com. Anything that you want to take, you can find as a program. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing those resources with us, Mary. That's, that's great. Um, I, I have another question. You mentioned that you worked on writing position papers for yes. the CDC. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and why you got involved or why you were tapped uh, to do that? <laughs> Terry Mitchell is um, one of my best friends that lives in Austin, Texas, and she's a physical therapist. She's absolutely tremendous. And Terry and I have taught together for many years. Matter of fact, I brought her on board when I did the Marine Corps program. We visited and we trained Marines on every Marine Corps installation in the world. Um, wow, wow, that's and, awesome. And the thing is, the Marines were tasked to come to be trained. They had no idea what the program was or what they were going to be doing. And so they would be sitting there and out would walk Mary and Terry and the aquatic specialist for the Marine Corps who was named Carrie. So we had the <laughs> Mary and Terry show. The thing is, Terry and I are both about five feet tall. <laughs> I love it. And so they see these two little older ladies come out and it's like, huh, they're going to really work me out. And um, we did. And uh, they would come out and, and say, my legs feel like rubber. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, one of my bylines is give me something and I can make it more difficult for you. Um, That's great. I guess the, the water is the great equalizer, right? I mean, oh, it, it is. <laughs> uh, we made believers out of all of them, and the program is continuing. That was the most wonderful experience, has been working with wounded warriors and with the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps were really getting almost desperate because the rotation back to Iraq and Afghanistan was turning over so fast because too many of the Marines were injured from overtraining. And that was running with these heavy packs on their back and boots twice a day for miles. And so we could alleviate that and help to heal them by doing some of the training in the pool with the water running. So um, it's, it's just been a wonderful experience being able to work with the military, and I've been very privileged to work with the military. I started originally, my first work with the military uh, was with the amputees. It grew from there to saying, you know, I think we need this for all the wounded warriors. And so that's why we developed two programs, one for the physical therapy side of the house and one for the sergeant majors 
in the uh, Wounded Warrior Battalions. And so we did that study for a year and had amazing results. And uh, the results have been published in a peer-reviewed journal. So it's, it's just been, it's given me wonderful opportunities. And my joy is being able to give back. It helps me stay active. Ruth Sova, who is the president of ATRI, loves giving me new challenges. And so... Uh, <laughs> And I know you're up for the challenge. <laughs> this, this weekend, it was, um, I've taught core stabilization for Balancing Gate many times, but my other one was improving common brain issue function. And so she has me into the dementia and Alzheimer's area now, and I'll be doing a seven-hour course on that in October by Zoom. But, um, you know, and I do a lot of the I Chi. I'm a master trainer in I Chi. Um, one thing that uh, maybe you don't know, I'm also, I've been inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. That's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Congratulations. What an incredible accolade. What an honor. Thank you for well, sharing I, that with us. Uh, I will say that it was not for my <laughs> expert swimming advice. It was for my work in adaptive type aquatics. But still, I can say I was inducted into the Hall of Fame. So I've done all kinds of things, and I just keep looking for new challenges because that's what life's all about. That's what keeps you young. So, so admirable to be involved with the, the military and giving back in that way to people who have served. Um, you're, you're, you're serving those who've served our country, and that's just so noble and wonderful, and I'm sure must be so gratifying. Tell us more about the CDC position paper. Okay, the position paper, um, Terry Mitchell and myself did a lot of research. If you go to cdc.gov backslash healthy swimmer, uh, you will see a lot of the guidelines. I always get uh, the latest updates from the CDC. One thing that they said that many people have debated is you do not wear a mask in the pool. That is because if the mask gets wet, you can't breathe. So it's a risk. If the instructor is on deck, as long as they are teaching and moving, they do not need to have the mask on. As soon as they stop to talk to anyone, they must put the mask back on. Part of this is because that as they talk and those little aerosol particles come out of their mouth, they'd only travel six feet and drop straight down into the water where they dissolve immediately. So uh, they're safe. We are looking at going forward to uh, where is the next phase? Right now, we're basically doing therapy or any type of a pool program, maintaining that six to 10 foot distance. And, and that is hard, but uh, there are many ways that we can do that. We, one is the easiest way is by limiting the number of participants. In therapy, it's not hard because therapy is basically one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, we are getting to the point now where we're going into the types of protocols where um, it's hands-on. And if it's hands-on, we are still looking for more guidance on, um, yes, it says no mask, and we agree with that. Uh, matter of fact, we've experimented, and now you cannot breathe through the mask, a face shield. And uh, if you use a face shield, it must be a straight one. It can't be one of the cheaper ones that flares out. But we have many of our uh, treatments that are hands-on. And so we, we have to think about how can we do that safely. And the feeling is that anytime someone comes for a session, and it doesn't matter whether it's a class to swim or for therapy, not only do they answer all the questions, but they have their temperature taken. We tell you that if you do not feel good, do not come. So, um, it's the basics that we have everywhere else in our life right now. But uh, the main one is that 
we do not want you wearing a mask in the pool because it is a danger to you. You are supporting a patient and that mask gets wet and you can't get the breath in. You've got to find a way to support that patient and get the mask on. That is where the paper is going. But it paper mainly talks about the wearing of masks, uh, social distancing, how to do it, uh, what to do when uh, people arrive at the facility or the pool, the fact that showers should be taken at home. Ideally, pool should have a shower on deck. And if they do, then they are to rinse, we call it a rinse then, instead of a shower, <laughs> um, before they get into the water. And we're doing that simply to get all the body lotions off of them. Because when you wear any type of lotion into the pool, you're disrupting the proper chemistry that we have in the pool. And we have up the amount of chlorine that we, or bromine in the pool. And for like chlorine, we want a minimum of two point parts per million, where it used to be 1.6. So we have upped that. And then we look a lot at the ventilation system. And if the pool does not have a ventilation system, it is not a safe pool. We do that and outside of what would normally be safety regulations, we ask that doors be open or windows be open to get as much airflow in as possible. And so that's, that's the main things that we're talking about, but we've given um, how you can arrange people in a pool and given them step-by-step -step guidance of what to do uh, when they are allowed to come back to the pool. That's great, Mary. Thank you for that great description there. I think um, one of the key points you've made about the pool is that the coronavirus can't live in, in, in pool water. And so it's not a method of transmission. And so that, that's, that's very comforting um, to people. It's really sort of what happens on the deck or on the beach, right. um, that, that's the hazard. And I think putting, putting those screening um, processes into place, you know, symptoms and temperature and, right. and, and social distancing. And, and if that part can happen, then being in the water can be safe. Um, right. and, and I will add that you are required to wear a mask up until the time you get ready to jump into the pool. Right. And as soon as you get out of the pool, the mask comes back on. Right. And good point that wearing a mask in the water uh, can be a suffocating hazard and a choking hazard. So that, right. that seems obvious, but uh, in the COVID era, nothing really is that obvious. <laughs> Everything is so different. <laughs> But good, good point. And, and truthfully, it's some people who are not necessarily swimming or submerging their heads all the way or doing exercises in the water still, you know, having the mask there can be, can be a hazard and is not necessary when you're in the water, so long as you're maintaining um, distance and um, have good ventilation. Um, ideally, in the summertime, an outdoor pool uh, is, is a great place to be. Um, right. So I think that's great, um, great and, advice. And between every session, there's always a 15 minute break so that lifeguards or someone can go around and disinfect anything that was touched. Uh, everyone has a little spot on deck that they can put their belongings. And uh, so, you know, we've, we've taken it to the point that it is now a very safe, activity to do and um it's very it's becoming more popular uh, it's just that so many people like myself 45 minutes isn't enough i <laughs> i can only get a mile in in 45 minutes i'm getting slow uh, <laughs> but i'll take the 45 minutes it's better I'll than nothing 45 minutes i'm not going to complain uh so uh and, and so uh, whatever you opt to do in the pool and uh, with the classes, limiting the size and emphasizing to them that they must stay a minimum of six feet apart is important. We actually recommend 10 feet apart. 
Oh, really? In, in the water? Mm -hmm. In the water because we know that they're going to sort of come closer together. So if it's like 10 feet, then we know we can probably depend on six feet. Oh, that's interesting. And I was thinking also that as people are um, exercising, they might be huffing and puffing and maybe right. you know, exhaling more forcefully or what have you, and so maybe a little extra distance. And, that's, and we know that when you do huff and you puff, aerosol particles do travel further, and they do further travel up to 10 feet. So um, that's why we try and make sure that distance is maintained uh, so that it can, is the safest that it can be. But as soon as those droplets drop into that water, they dissolve. Great. Dr. Weichel, thank you for bringing your patient and expert perspectives to our podcast today. It's been wonderful to hear how you stayed active despite the numerous challenges, some might say setbacks, you say challenges, that you have faced and their rippling effects on your body. We know that you are going to continue to help others while also prioritizing your own health. And we wish you all the best. I know we're going to stay in touch and continue to do some work together, you know, with the Spine Health Foundation. You have so much to offer us. We're so uh, appreciative of your time today to share your story and your expertise and your advice um, with the foundation and all of our listeners. When you have a negative outlook, or you say, oh, poor pity me, that's when you're not going to recover. And so you say, how can I adapt to meet my own situation? And go forward from there. There's always somebody out there to help you. That's fantastic. That was so well stated. I have followed this foundation. I have all the old journals and because they have so much good information on there. What I like is the research. I've watched the growth that you have done and you encouraged to do. And so I'm always promoting you. And uh, like I said, uh, anything we teach has to be research-based. You're one of my main sources. And so if I have a question, I go searching and usually can find the answer. Very little research that we can transfer to the water being done in the United States. Most of it is being done in Spain, Portugal, and Brazil. At the National Spine Health Foundation, something we believe in most is providing hope for recovery through sharing stories of success and expertise. It isn't always easy to find someone to relate to, even though 100 million adults suffer from neck or low back pain each year. To hear more stories of recovery and access educational materials about spine health, visit us at spinehealth.org. If you're interested in hearing from the nation's leading spine experts on a variety of spine health related topics, please visit spinetalks.org. That's spine-talks.org. And be on the lookout for a brand new program, Spine Talk Cities, coming in summer of 2020. If you're interested in supporting our show financially, you can contribute at the link provided. Thank you for listening. The information and views expressed in the Get Back to It podcast are intended for informational purposes and should not be used as a substitute for professional medical advice or to replace the services of trained healthcare providers. To view the National Spine Health Foundation's full disclaimer, visit spinehealth.org.